So in today's video, we're going to talk about one of the inborn errors of metabolism related to carbohydrate metabolism, uh, the glycogen storage disorders. Uh, there is a few of them. Uh, today, we're going to go over the first one, uh, which is uh, glycogen storage disease 1, also known as uh, von Gerke's, uh, named after the individual uh, who first uh, described the disease. Uh, so when, when we're looking at this uh, syndrome, uh, what it's helpful is to kind of go over uh, carbohydrate metabolism that's related to uh, what we're going uh, to von Gierke's disease. So uh, let's just say this is a cell. Let's call this a liver cell. Uh, this is uh, what we're going to be talking about mostly. So what happens in uh, a cell is you have glucose from the outside. So this is a glucose molecule, uh, and it can it can go freely into and out of the cell. But once it goes into the cell, the first thing you, the, the cell wants to do is it wants to trap it. And the way it traps it is by adding a phosphate group to the uh, six carbon. So this is regular glucose. And what it's doing here is adding a phosphate group so we're not, uh, to the six carbon. So we call it glucose six phosphates. Now, this glucose here. Uh, cannot leave the cell. No matter, uh, it's going to be no longer impermeable to the cell, so it's going to just bounce back out. And this is the purpose of the phosphorylation, that you want to trap it. You don't want to just, you know, glucose going in and out, getting in and out. So in order for it to leave, so say for the, the purpose of the liver cell, one of the purposes is, is whenever the glucose level in your blood goes low, it wants to take all this glucose 6-phosphate, convert it into glucose, so that we can actually show that. So uh, what it'll do is it'll take this glucose 6-phosphate, convert it into glucose, and then send the glucose on out. Uh, and it cannot leave until you have this, you know, until you remove this phosphate. So, you know, it would be nice if this was the only step, but you don't want this all to occur in the cytosol because, again, the liver cell would needlessly lose uh, glucose. So you actually, even though it sounds simple, you actually do not have... Uh, that simple. You actually need to go through a process before you get there. We can't go straight. And so that's what we're going to talk about. So this is occurring in the cytosol. Uh, what needs to occur is it actually needs to go through the endoplasmic reticulum. So I'm going to, of course, draw the endoplasmic reticulum really large. This isn't going to be, you know, an accurate one. So what you want to know is outside here is the cytosol and outside here is the endoplasmic reticulum. So uh, the first thing we need to do is we need to get the glucose 6-phosphate into the cell. And there's an actual transporter for this, uh, which I'm going to draw here. Uh, and this transporter is called the glucose 6-phosphate transporter 1. So very, very simple name. And so what will happen is this glucose 6-phosphate will go into the transporter and into the ER. So you get a glucose 6-phosphate uh, enzyme here. So there you go, glucose 6-phosphate. So this here is still, let's write this down glucose 6-phosphate. Now, once it's in the endoplasmic reticulum, it's going to get into, uh, it's going to get into contact with the glucose 6-phosphatase enzyme. And this is actually bound to the, in, the, to the in, inside of the uh, endoplasmic reticulum. And uh, what will occur is this glucose 6-phosphate Will, will get transformed into a glucose molecule and an inorganic phosphate molecule plus. So you end up getting a regular glucose and the inorganic phosphate. Then we have uh, some transporters here. Uh, we call this just a regular glucose transporter. And the glucose will then is now able to leave the transporter uh, and go into the cytosol and once you have glucose in the cytosol it can come out and the other thing that I, I did forget to mention I'll, I'll mention it right now is glucose 6-phosphate not only can it come from the blood but there's another source of it as well and that's glycogen and just you know just as a quick review uh, glycogen is just a uh, chain of glucose so this is our glycogen and glycogen uh, when it breaks down it it becomes glucose 6-phosphate 
And so for glycogen to break down and be released into this, uh, into the uh, blood, it can't just go glycogen, glucose, and blood. No, it has to become glycogen, has to become glycose 6-phosphate. Then it has to go over into the endoplasmic reticulum through the glucose 6-phosphate transporter 1, get converted from glucose 6-phosphate to glucose by the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase, and then it has to go through the endoplasmic reticulum back out into the cytosol, and then you can have glucose into the blood. And this is the normal response when uh, someone is in a fasting state or a hypoglycemic state. So in von Guericke's disease, you have a problem with this setup. Primarily two, there's, there's actually many different types, but the primary causes is two. One, there could be a problem with the glucose 6-phosphate, that's type 1A, and the other one, there can be a problem with the transporter, that's type 1B. So um, what will happen if you have a problem with this? Uh, if you have a problem with uh, 1A, you'll have an accumulation of glucose 6-phosphatase, um, which will back up, you get more glucose 6-phosphatase in the cell, which will back up and you'll have increased glycogen, and type 1B as well. Uh, there won't be that much inside the endoplasmic reticulum, it'll be more in the cytosol, but you, you get the same uh, lasting effect. So uh, just to kind of recap, uh, what are the two conditions that uh, that are known 1A and 1B. So this is von Kierkegaard's disease 1A, von Kierkegaard's disease 1B. 1A is a deficiency of the uh, glucose 6-phosphatase enzyme. And with 1B, it's a deficiency of uh, glucose 6-phosphate transporter 1, which is also written as G6PT1. Okay, and that's this enzyme, uh, that's this transporter there. Okay, so uh, now you know what the problem is. You, uh, we have uh, overflow of gl uh, glucose 6-phosphate and glycogen, and so what will happen? So uh, in, in talking about this, we kind of need to go over the pathways uh, that, that can occur. So if we talk about, let's just start with glycogen. So glycogen can become uh, glucose 6-phosphate. And once it becomes glucose 6-phosphate, it can then turn into glucose uh, utilizing the enzyme uh, uh, glucose 6-phosphatase. Let's put that in there, okay. And, um, but uh, glucose 6-phosphate uh, can also you know, undergo a gly uh, glycolysis. Uh, because it is one of the um, steps in glycolysis is glucose phosphate and so then it's going to become pyruvate so this is just from regular glycolysis okay and then we know that pyruvate can then become uh, acetyl coa uh, which can then go into the krebs cycle and all that stuff now glucose 6 phosphate is also one of the uh, 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 substrate for the uh, pentose uh, phosphate pathway uh, and what that does is that ends up producing um, uh, ribose 5-phosphate, which is used for purine uh, synthesis. So what, what, what's the problem here? So this is the normal uh, mechanism. Well, what's the problem that you're going to get? You're going to get decreasing glucose 6-phosphate. And if you have decreasing glucose 6-phosphate, you're going to have decreased glucose. And so uh, when, when you have decreased glucose, the liver cannot release uh, glucose when required, and so you lead to, this leads to hypoglycemia, especially in the fasting state. So this is one of the uh, direct results of losing glucose 6-phosphate. But if you have decreased glucose, well, we're going to have a lot more of glucose 6-phosphate. And so whenever you have a lot of glucose 6-phosphate, it tends to shunt into these pathways, and these will cause other problems as well. So when you have uh, the increased glucose 6-phosphate, uh, this will include, increase ribose 5-phosphate. And so when this occurs, you're going to get a, uh, the catabolic process will get activated. So this is a catabolic process. And when um, ribose 5-phosphate uh, ribose breaks down, it becomes uric acid. So what, what is another symptom that, uh, that may occur? You can get hyperuricemia, which can um, predispose to gout. So one thing we can get as a direct result is hypoglycemia, and secondarily we can get 
hyperuricemia. So, but wait a minute, not only will ribose 5-phosphate get activated, but also you will have an increase in pyruvate. You'll get a substantial increase pyruvate. And so this will also lead to alternative pathways. Uh, the first one is going to be um, via lactate dehydrogenase is going to be lactate. Uh, lactate, uh, which is lactic acid, and so immediately they're going to have lactic acidosis. Acidosis, we see. Okay, so we're going to get lactic acidosis, and um, another pathway that because it, it gets so overwhelmed that pyruvate is also a substrate for alanine. So you're going to get uh, hyperalanemia. Alanemia. It's kind of tough to say, but. Uh, you get an increase of this amino acid as well. Now, of course, not only is it going to become lactate, not only going to get you a lot of uh, uh, alanine, but it's also going to increase your acetyl-CoA. So as acetyl-CoA uh, goes into the Krebs cycle, eventually it will get overwhelmed. And so what it ends up doing is instead of going into the Krebs cycle, it starts making cholesterol. And it starts making fatty acid which then, you know, from, from when the glycolysis uh, um, steps bind with glycerol to give you triacylglycerol. And so this is going to lead to um, hyperlipidemia. So you can see all the various conditions uh, that occur as a result of this enzyme uh, being removed. Hyper hypoglycemia is a direct effect. Hyperuricemia, because as it goes through the pentose 5 uh, pentose phosphate uh, pathway, increase alanine as pyruvate gets shunted, increase uh, lactic acid, acetylcholine will cause increased lipids. And so this is a general um, mechanism underlying these conditions. Okay, so um, what would be the clinical aspect? So now we can talk about uh, clinical aspect. This is something that uh, is, uh, does present within the first few days of life so uh, again the, the main thing is going to be the hypoglycemia so the in the neonatal period let's talk about neonatal period first um, one of the first things you'll see is hypoglycemia and this can predispose to seizures so this is something that can present to seizures also of course you, you know if you when you do the blood test you will get lactic acidosis and you will also see hyperuricemia and we've kind of already discussed uh, why you would see that uh, however, uh, after the neonatal period, into about three, four months, uh, there's going to be some other uh, presentations. Uh, one of the interesting things is as you get uh, lipids uh, deposition, you have hyperlipidemia, they get something called a doll face, which is kind of similar to uh, Cushing syndrome, where you get that moon face. Uh, and in this doll face, they have these really fat, chubby cheeks, as you know, the lipids don't have anywhere to go, so they tend to go into this. Uh, area and then they, you know, it, and they get really uh, big arms, uh, which are very characteristic uh, of this condition. The other thing is they're going to have a distended abdomen, and the reason is is because remember this is mostly occurring in the liver, so after a while you do get hepatomegaly. Uh, you get hepatomegaly, and this also can occur in the kidneys, so you get enlarged kidneys, so you kind of have this uh, organomegaly, and. Um, and, and you even get this hypotonia uh, that starts to occur because it's, it does occur in the muscles as well. So every kidneys and muscles is what you want to think of. Now, uh, long term, I mean, these days we don't really have long term uh, problem because it is pretty well treated and you can get it uh, fairly well under control uh, with the right treatment. But, there are, you know, say for example, <coughs> they're not following treatment or it doesn't get caught for whatever reason, uh, there are some conditions that occur later on in life. Uh, one of these is an hepatic adenoma. Um, and this is a hepatic adenoma, which can, you know, then hemorrhage, uh, which is possible. Uh, and this is just because because you have the increased cholesterol that we talked about earlier, you get you, get, you, make, you do make a lot of hormones, uh, steroid hormones. And so this can lead to, you know, females, it can lead to uh, PCOS. However, it, it does not not have the uh, hirsutism and the um, acne due to the increased testosterone. So PCOS without that. So they still will get the oligomenorrhea and the multiple cysts uh, in their ovaries. Uh, it can also lead to pulmonary hypertension as well uh, if, if this is allowed to proceed. And um, 
pancreatitis is another condition and this is just because of the uh, hyperlipidemia it causes uh, it can affect the uh, pancreas as well and um, the but probably the most serious is going to be the renal problems uh, in long term they do start to get renal symptoms uh, generally after 20 years uh, they will start to develop proteinuria which is one of the first markers of uh, damage to the kidneys uh, they also tend to have hypertension uh, they tend to get stones uh, and uh, their creatine clearance is going to be lower than usual and uh, usually these will require uh, dialysis or transplant and even even the liver can eventually require uh, transplant if if it's not treated well um, I mean how do you diagnose it it is generally a clinical diagnosis um, based on the symptoms but I mean when you do the lab work of course uh, the lab work we've kind of already discussed uh, low glucose with high lipids right uh, you would also have the uh, high uric acid and the high lactate and of course you're gonna have the high alanine so these are the uh, lab laboratory findings however if you do want to do a definitive you could do a liver biopsy and you can um, look for the mutation so that's the uh, definitive uh, treatment there uh, sorry definitive bio biopsy uh, definitive diagnosis there sorry now how would you treat something like this um, actually interestingly enough if you can maintain their blood uh, blood glucose that actually tends to abate all the symptoms so the first and foremost uh, you want to maintain normal glucose uh, maintain normal blood glucose um, and this can either be done by feeding through ng tube um, or by uh, giving make sure they're eating well enough for TPN whatever you need to do uh, uncooked starch is actually uncooked cornstarch uncooked cornstarch has been the most successful because it's slow release of glucose uh, and so it works out pretty good and you do want to avoid you don't want to give any sucrose fructose or lactose you want to stick to glucose uh, so that the other pathways aren't uh, don't contribute to this uh, the other thing is you want to try to decrease the uric acid uh, and that's done, you know, just how you treat gout. Uh, you can just give allopurinol uh, and or, you know, azanthine oxidase inhibitor, um, whichever one is better. Uh, you do want to treat the lipidemia. Uh, this is oftentimes done with uh, HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, um, which is, you know, uh, responsible for all the uh, cholesterol that does accumulate. So that, that tends to have... Uh, help that or you can use fibrates as well um, for the renal you do want to protect the kidneys uh, you can give uh, ACE inhibitors for that they tend to do a pretty good job uh, of that um, if sometimes there has been uh, some patients who have neutropenia however by just giving them the uh, colony stimulating factor uh, the GM CSF uh, has been helpful um, and finally uh, liver transplants uh, if it gets really bad, they, bad, they can get into uh, liver failure, and then death can be required as well. So this is um, your the first glycos uh, glycogen storage disease. Hope you guys learned a lot, and see you guys in the next video. Thanks.